Have you ever heard of the terminology doof doof party? Well, some people call them bush raves. Well, if you haven't heard of this terminology, then that's probably a good thing, as I am about to blow your mind. You see, here in Australia, we have these things called doof parties. And it's where a bunch of hippie degenerates who refuse to work and live on Centrelink gather around in a secret location out in the middle of the bush. They set up a bunch of speakers, they set up their strobe lights, and they dance for days on end listening to music that no one can stand to hear the sound of sober. Here, just check it out. Roll the clip. But what if I told you these innocent tree huggers had a dark side, an underbelly, and that one of a force not to be reckoned with. G'day guys and welcome back to the Gulag. My name is Ryan and here we tell true crime to come out of Australia. Now strap yourselves in because we're going to take a dive into the underbelly of Byron Bay and what happened to this young man named Jackson Stacker. And how did he end up face down, dismantled in a paddock in the middle of nowhere? So without further ado, let's get stuck into the story. This is the true story of Jackson Stacker. Now meet Jackson, a 25 year old Melbourne born and raised hardworking man. Now he was an apprentice electrician in his fourth year with a bright future ahead of him. But everything changed when he decided to leave it all behind and embark on a road trip down the coast. Now, Jackson was always passionate about surfing and loved his free time catching waves. He also had a serious relationship with his girlfriend and was loved by his family and friends. But Jackson felt there was something missing and he wanted to find himself in a different way. So Jackson packed up his belongings in 2019 and head out for a hippie style lifestyle in his high ace van. His destination? Byron Bay, known for its laid-back atmosphere and its vibrant party scene. Now at first, Jackson seemed to be living the dream, surfing during the day and partying with his newfound friends at night. But it wasn't long before he got into psychedelics and LSD, which started to take a drastic toll on his mental health. Jackson became detached from reality, believing that he was living in a different dimension. His once peaceful road trip turned into a nightmare as he started attracting the wrong crowd. These degenerates would hang around his van, taking advantage of his vulnerability and fueling his drug addiction. They would often take him to dangerous parties in the bushland, miles away from any reception. And these are the parties where often young youths of New South Wales were dying at these parties as a result from ODs and dehydration. It was here that Jackson's paranoia reached its peak. He realized that he had made a grave mistake and the people around him were actually dangerous. But it was already too late. He was caught up in this dangerous world, fueled by drugs and alcohol. And not before long, Jackson started to really seek an excuse to escape these beaches and these car parks and head out to the sand dunes by himself where he would go anywhere between two to three days and return very gaunt and skinny and only return when his Centrelink payments went in. So Jackson's family and friends were worried sick about him, but he was too far gone to listen. It wasn't until his mum Sandra finally realized the gravity of this situation and decided to track him down and reach out to his older friends. Now, one of his old friends from Cairns told police while they were staying in a recluse camp in North Queensland up in the Tablelands, they experienced a lot of mind controlling rituals and cult-like behavior. And eventually, they both left after Jackson started to believe in these people and started to really buy into their sexual cults and so his friend felt like he had to pull him out of there. But during this period of time, there was border restrictions in place and this prevented Jackson from returning home so he felt like he was trapped in Byron Bay. And well this, well this is where things turn ugly because on the 22nd of July, 2020, Jackson's mother would hear from him for the very last time. Okay, so from here forth guys, things get a little messy. So viewer's discretion is advised from this point forth. So on the 22nd of July, Sandra, which was Jackson's mother, she gave him a call and she reported that everything was as per usual. 
that he was his normal self and nothing was out of the normal. Now from there, he had his van parked up in Byron Bay Beach. So it was very common to see a lot of vans parked up for months at a time as the backpackers stay there and then they might move two weeks later, come back, so on and so forth. But after about a month of this van sitting in the one spot with no human activity, a few backpackers decided to call the police and report on it. Now when the police went out there and they opened the van up, they soon realized it was Jackson's van as all his belongings, including his wallet, his phone, and everything that was important to him was still in the van. Now it was very evident to the police officers that it was quite musky, so it had been closed up for the entire time, but they did report that it had been turned over and ransacked, almost like someone has gone through all of these belongings and then locked the vehicle and left it there. So now it's the 24th of August, exactly a month and two days from when his mother last spoke to Jackson. And that's when they found Jackson's body. Now Jackson was face down in a paddock about 40 kilometers away from Byron Bay in a little tourist attraction called Sleepy Hollow. Now when they found him, he had actually been scalped and they found his scalp with his dreadlock still attached to it about 13 meters away from his body. Not only that, they also found three fingers that had been cut off and scattered around the area alongside half of his teeth. Now this to the police seemed pretty brutal on sight, but it got even worse because as they rolled him over, he had a knife plunged into his chest all the way to the stilts. Okay guys, so you know how I mentioned earlier how things get weird? Well, this is that part of the story. So after they conducted the investigation, they actually found zero DNA and zero evidence. Yes, they swabbed the van, they swabbed the surrounding area, they swabbed the body, the clothing, everything they could possibly get their hands on, and it came back with zero matches and zero DNA evidence of anyone else but Jackson. Now this is where 60 Minutes is doing a cover of this next week, and I'm thinking they're going to find out the real reason but the coroner in the New South Wales police report put down on the death certificate that this was a suicide, which makes absolutely zero sense to his family. Now I know what you're thinking, he was on acid and LSD and he was addicted to these substances and maybe he could have inflicted this damage himself. But there is just no chance that he was able to plunge a hunting knife six inches into his chest whilst cutting off his fingers and removing his own teeth with no tools or utensils. So I'm gonna leave it up to you guys in the comment section, but next Sunday, 60 Minutes Australia will be doing an episode on this. So 60 Minutes, if you see this, your broski might need a job. But other than that, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's story. I know we don't have the answers, but we are going to find out next week on 60 Minutes Investigation on this story about how this young man met his demise. Until then, I will see you guys again tomorrow. Thank you for watching.